Hi everyone, thank you for coming along to this interactive session. Um, if we haven't met, my name is Sarah Wingrove. I'm a PhD student working towards an interdisciplinary doctorate on Analista. Uh, I'm also a big fan of zines, which is one of the reasons I pitched this workshop today. So I'll give a quick overview of the structure we have for this workshop and then we can crack on. Okay. So I will give a brief presentation on what exactly zines are, an overview of their history, especially in lesbian feminist collectives, and consider how we can use them today within the analista community. So the second part of the session, we can start working on our pages for a collective analista research summit zine, and I'll give some tips on how to get started. So I'd just like to give credit at the top and thanks here to my supervisor, Professor Diane Watt, whose MA Medieval Zines workshop at the University of Surrey has heavily inspired and informed this session. So what is a zine? A zine, as I'll explain, uh, can take a variety of forms, uh, but most commonly it's usually a little booklet made of paper and mixed materials, generally focusing on one specific topic or subject. From reading Anne's journals, uh, you may recognize the term quarto, which is a publishing format where eight pages are present, uh, printed onto one sheet of paper or parchment on both sides and then folded and cut to make separate leaves, which are then sewn together. Uh, some zines take this form as it uses little resources, but others like the zine that we'll be making today are curated from a multitude of separate pages collated together digitally. So Lucy Robinson has said that the zine by its nature is difficult to pin down. She says, quote, zines are either too diverse or too inclusive to easily draw boundaries around as a genre. She goes on to say that some approaches define them by their genealogy from fan work. To others, zines are markers of changing do-it-yourself media possibilities. So here we're thinking about the shift I just described from the physical, tangible book to the digital file. I like this quote from Robinson, which is quite nostalgia-inducing. She says, zines punctuate the development of self-publishing, from bandocopier to Xerox machine, to public photocopier, to desktop publishing software, to home printer, to screen. Now, Eleanor Whitney says that, quote, what all zines have in common is that their writers and editors, often the same people or person, uh, feel like they have something important to say that they would like to share with others. Indeed, Laura van Leuven has given an idea of what a zine can be. They are works which are self-published or published by a small independent publisher. Self-publishing allows marginalized voices to express themselves beyond the constraints of mainstream media and also lets authors take control of the process of publishing. Zines are non-commercial and are printed in small numbers, generally with the intention for low circulation and a regular or one-off publication. Finally, she says they're a vehicle for ideas, expression and art. They build connections between people and within groups and provide modes of communication in addition to information dissemination. So typically, zines are said to originate in the science fiction fan communities of the 1930s, and the name stems from the phrase fan magazine. One of the first zines to be considered as such was called The Comet, and it was published by the Science Correspondence Club in Chicago, Illinois, from 1930 to 1933. Jonah Komen has said that, quote, the small folded formats native to zines are also reminiscent to the materiality and physical formats of medieval and early modern books created for English readers, such as the Sarum Books of Hours and the Folding Almanac. I would also argue that they can be viewed to have their historic roots in the pamphlets which were popular till around the mid 19th century. These also had vague definitions and forms which shifted over time. In the year 1617, Jean Monchou defined them as Episculum Stolidorum, which Jode Raymond translates as a fool's diminutive performance. Whilst by 1716, Miles Davies would specify it as a stitched, not bound book tending to calumny or scandal. Now, whilst this may not seem to have much relevance to the zines of the 30s, uh, the political potential of the zine format these easily replicated and disseminated little books would be unleashed first in the 60s with the Beat Generation and subsequently coming into its own with the punk and riot girl movements of the 80s and 90s. So the 60s and 70s saw the format of zines expand for the first time as technology developed and culture shifted. Offset lithographic printing became more widely available. So original comics and text could be cheaply replicated. In Britain, countercultural magazines would fight back against mainstream press and producers and distributors would often be hounded by police. 
The 80s saw a further rise in zine production, and Stephen Perkins says that punk zines of the late 70s especially, quote, played a pivotal role in establishing an aesthetic ter territory, which was to be the inspiration and starting point for many underground zines during this decade, unquote. Feminist and queer offshoots of the punk movement would form, such as Queer Core, and develop their own political publications in this and the following decade. Fantastic titles, including Gay Rage from 1993 and Chaos Order from 1994 are certainly worth looking out for. And I recommend looking them up in the Queer Zine Archive Project, which is a phenomenal global archive from the 70s onwards that is all online. Now, Riot Girl would pick up in the early 90s and bands would publish their own zines, including titles such as Bikini Kill, which is created by the band members, um, and other igniting works like Jigsaw, Snarler, Bust, and Bitch. Whilst queer people and feminists weren't the only ones publishing zines in this time, Robert Manana and Diane Watt have said that the publications from these communities, quote, are marked by the ethical and intellectual imperative to oppose privileged practices and to foster inclusive communities across time and cultures. Aesthetically, the zine would continue to change over the years. Chloe Arnold describes how between the 70s and 80s, the grungy do-it-yourself aesthetic arose, moving away from the polished little magazine style of the 30s fanzines. This is probably most recognizable to those of us now, with magazine cutouts collaged with um, illustrations, typewriter text, ink, um, ink drawings, and so much more. A great zine explosion occurred in the mid 1990s, as it was called, um, and as the format became more popular and were commonly sold in independent bookshops. But this is said to have waned off around 1995, 96, after media attention, which had circulated around the phenomena of the format, dropped off. Many zines at this time moved online, transforming into the new format of the e zine, which is kind of what we'll be curating today. Now to round off this really whistle-stop tour of history, I wanted to emphasize what I picked upon with the zines in the 80s and 90s and the networks of feminist, lesbian, and queer people involved in zine production. Jerry Gray, who is a current queer zine star, has described the zines of these decades as, quote, acts of protest, of activism, of preservation, and communication. Now, the two last words there, I think, are especially important when thinking about where history is concerned and whose histories are preserved and communicated. And before we move on, I'd just like to read this quote from Lucy Robinson's chapter on zines and history making. So she says, quote, whether produced by riot girls looking for inspiration from suffragettes or anarcho punks learning the lessons from the previous generation's activists or queer activists building community memorials, zines construct their own alternative canons and syllabuses. We can read them into the longer history of queer, black, feminist and working class histories that enact justice in the present by rearming the past. Zinesters have their own role in this historical genealogy, and they also bring something new to it. Zines deserve a place alongside some of the founding projects of queer and feminist history. At a time when academic publication is quantifiably impactful, with analytics to demonstrate reach and therefore value, zines help us situate ourselves in a radical tradition instead. So, with this, we've started to suggest how zines can be used in discussing their history and how their uses have changed over the last 100 years. But as we approach making our own, here are some specific ways that people have used zines, um, though obviously it's not limited to this. So they have been used to disseminate new art and comics, uh, poetry, lyrics and recipes, reviews for new films, for gigs, uh, po political manifestos, maps, sexual health guides, and so much more. And what I think is really relevant to us in sort of in this conference, particularly, is that they're an opportunity to share research in accessible ways. Uh, I started making a zine from a paper that I gave at the Analyst the Society conference back in April, and I did that to share my ideas in a creative way, in a way, and in a way that would be under my control and that would continue to be open access. So the yeah. We change slide. Thank you. Uh, now I pitched this session as I'm really interested in collaborative and community-led dissemination, uh, which I've argued elsewhere that the analyst of research and fan communities are really, really good at. Um, I mean, look at the size of this conference. <laughs> uh, but what does this have to do with Analista? 
I think this is um, a twofold answer. So the first part is the relevance of pamphlets in Anne's life and how we can use them to understand her through the texts she engaged with. And the second is how we can use our zine to continue sharing cultural information about Anne and us, her 21st century enthusiasts. If we think back to the session yesterday on memory studies presented by Martha Siobhan Hecker and uh, Natalie Hungate, having a document like a zine is a really effective way to produce a communicative memory. It will have an object, the zine, to reignite these memories, both through the action of creating it and the language within it. So BritishPamphlets.org, which is run by Research Libraries UK and the University of Southampton, have noted that, quote, pamphlets were a significant form of publication in the 19th century, and they can complement other publications such as books, newspapers and periodicals. They were often published by individuals, parties or pressure groups with strongly held views. So they can be particularly valuable in aiding our understanding of the debates of their age. As the BritishPamphlets.org have also sort of noted um, that pamphlets often get forgotten when we're constructing these histories. And in my references earlier to the similarities between pamphlet and zine cultures, um, I alluded to how Anne would gain new knowledge in part from the pamphlet she read. We know full well how dedicated Anne was to expanding her horizons and her understanding of the world beyond the limited the limited education that she was available to get through official routes. Now, if you go to the Pat with Potential website, you can go through the spreadsheet of Lister's bookshelf, which is one of my favorite spreadsheets they have. Um, and you can literally see what she was engaging with. And in many instances, what she thought of these texts. So a great example of a pamphlet that Anne read is the one on the screen. It's a report of the proceedings in the case of the Reverend James Stovin and Eleanor Charlotte, his wife, and Dame Carolyn Schuckberg, defendant. Now, Anne read this in December of 1822, and this was just one of Reverend James Stovin's pamphlets. Earlier in his life in 1792, um, only a year after Anne was born, he published Advice to the Poor with a short remonstrance to those in higher circumstances. Now, Anne doesn't comment on the contents of this small unbound report, but she does mention a particular part of it in her journal, the verdict of the proceedings. Pamphlets were important in guiding how readers may view the world, and the fact that Anne is focusing in on the verdict may be I mean, because we know she likes to give precise details, but we can also infer that it is making her think about how people behave towards each other and what the legal ramifications are in this case when you go against what's acceptable in early 19th century England. And with all of this in mind, the point that I want to make here is that we can learn more about Anne and her peers through these kinds of publications, and they shouldn't, as the, as the British um, Pamphlets Organisation identified, we shouldn't forget about them. So. Coming back to the present, zines continue to be a really effective and impactful way of disseminating inf information within small communities. And there's also an important route through which to archive community endeavors. Uh, Calderdale Libraries held a series of writing workshops in March and April this year. And from these, an e-zine was produced from the works that attendees made. So this document includes acrostic poetry written on paper top hats, and scan which were scanned into a computer. Uh, images of Shivden and Anne's journals, and even a ghost journal entry from the perspective of Anne are included. The online publication is in itself an artifact which reflects not only knowledge and appreciation of Anne Lister, but also acts as a record of those interested in her in West Yorkshire in the 2020s. Now this is where we come in. So today the plan is to start working on ideas and producing our own zine for the conference. This is a very flexible endeavor. Uh, the only thing that we ask is that you work on a single A4 page. Now that could be on Word, that could be on Publisher or a literal sheet of A4. Um, you can use it in portrait or landscape, however you like. And we ask that you use that space to express your connection to Anne and her world, how you've come to her, what her story in this community means to you. And you can be as personal or impersonal as you like. Um, some examples of things you may want to use um, that I've just thought about is uh, potentially comics or illustration, self-made collage, poetry, prose, a journal entry of your own maybe, photographs that you may have, um, recipes, as I mentioned earlier. I know that we've had cocktails made um, previously by this group and we have an amazing knowledge of early 19th century food and drink in this community. Um, other options is utilising the code and utilising the humour and at point sorrow that the community has shared over the last few years. 
Now, with regards to collating these, if you want your page to be included, um, please email this to anne.lister.research at gmail.com, preferably as an image file. If you've made your page physically rather than digitally, then you can take a photo of the page or use a scanner to send it in. I think the plan then is to share this as a digital easing to attendees. So if you do send it in, you are consenting for this to be shared within other members of the conference. So I've got some examples here to show which might give you some ideas. So to start with, uh, yeah, there's a few. We've got um, the one in the left hand corner is an Anlister, an Anlister specific zine. Um, which was made by a user on Etsy. I couldn't, I couldn't find the author's name. And this is sometimes an issue with zine production is that if people don't put their names on it, their names can be lost to history. So that this is something that I want to find out is actually who made this one. Um, the other one that I've got, I've actually got it to hand here is uh, the Queer Witch Club. Now that was created by a user called po at Poppy the Witch. I think they're on Instagram. Um, and the other one, here is by Kristen Half Curtis. Uh, now, Diane Watt made me aware of this scene, and it's actually a zine about making zines. Um, so, not so relevant for this, but I think, particularly if you want to go on and make your own zines going forward, this is a really great way of making a really tiny zine. Um, to start with, I think thinking about what we're making today, one of the ways that I've started working on this is mind mapping. So, I've started to think where I want my page to go and thinking about what materials I want to use. So I've started with Anne in the middle, of course, and I've started thinking about how I came to know of her. I started thinking particularly personally about the faces of Anne Lister, the portraits and portrayals of her. Um, I know that when I actually start building on it, I want to use and include some collage cutouts of the faces of Saran Jones and Maxine Peake, obviously who've portrayed her on screen, and possibly Vahishta Vardy, Baffada, Vahishta, Afadari, who portrayed her in Emma Donoghue's play a few years back. Um, we can go back between the slides because um, we've still got some time, um, but I've just included a few zine pieces that I've worked on over the years. Um, a piece of collage art on the right, on the right, yeah. Uh, here is one I made at another zine workshop where I didn't have any specific words I wanted to express, but I just wanted to create an image that started to open up what I was thinking about Anne as evolving beyond the frames of historical analysis and televisual representation. Um, and as you can see, the formats can really, really range, but it's just about finding what works creatively for you. And so I'm going to be around for the rest of this session if you have any questions, and I'll also be in the water closet before querying the language. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah. Do we have any questions for her now based on the presentation before we get into like making some zines? What is the deadline? Yeah. <sighs> <Just> <laughs> <laughs> um, good question. Originally we wanted to have- It's going to be quite open-ended, can't it? <laughs> I, I think originally we wanted to have these, um, the collective, zine link available when the recordings go up so i'm going to say mm -hmm. next saturday is the deadline okay. thanks jess for your question any questions for sarah the rest of the time for the session is available for us all to just hang out here mm. and work on some pages and talk about what we're making or get mm. ideas yeah if you've got any ideas or if you're not sure about an idea and you just want to bounce it off um i've always found any time oh are there any current zines that's one of the questions um in terms of an lister i do have this one i've got so one this... too Oh yeah, you've got a couple, don't you? This one is exceedingly vulgar. Mm -hmm. Let's see if the author, I know that I tracked this person down to order a copy because I saw somebody else had it and I found their Instagram account, but it is also a zine that does not have um, any attribution on it. So I don't have the name at hand. Mm -hmm. So I've just had a look. And so the Anne Lister historic zine, lesbian zine is by, um, it's from someone on Etsy. They're called Ink and Paper Original. 
Um, unfortunately, the zine isn't available to buy anymore. Um, but I think especially like, I think there's a few of us in the community who've got copies. Um, I think it's also always worth something like sharing and sort of being able to share images of it. The fact that it was such a, like, that's the nature of zines is that they often have such a limited run that if you don't get it originally, yeah, they're a finite resource. Um, which I, I guess that's the nice thing about making an e-zine is that it means that it's not a finite resource that we can share it a bit further if, if, if we so wish. I've got another example with me. This one is um, Good Luck with the Holidays and it's a zine about queer resilience. Oh, I love that. Uh, and there's just, this one is mostly um, text-based. Somebody was asking in the previous water closet if they could submit fanfic to the zine. Oh, and I said, yeah. yes. So we'll see. So it doesn't have, you know, even though this is a visual format, you can still submit written word for the zine. Mm. Well, that's the thing. A lot of the zines I've looked at, it's been, they have been spaces for which people can express creative writing mm. and illustrations. I love all the comics that come from them. There's been some, hang on, I've got another one. This is a completely different zine. It's called Radical Possibilities, Art and Queer Identity. And in the center, there's a comic that is about the author discovering the existence of Alison Bechtel, um, which I love, and just sort of like mapping queer histories and particularly like lesbian histories. They're just a really wonderful resource. Um, I'm just gonna pop in the chat. Um, so I mentioned in the presentation, um, the Queer Zine Archive. And some of the images that I used today were sourced from that. And I'm just going to pop it in because it is honestly so fun looking through it. Um, some of, I'll admit, some of the zines in it are quite saucy. Uh, <laughs> it's not, it's not child appropriate content, but especially some of the stuff from the 80s, there's a lot of um, stuff to do with um, the AIDS crisis and they've archived stickers that people were using. And that I think is part of zine culture as well. The fact that you'll get these community curated items which are just brilliant they turn out town a design of comics for the apples that's really cool that's really cool I think especially the fact that they are such small productions is you can have like a focused I don't know a focused aim for sort of fundraising with them as well um, which is really great I just wanted to share one of the submissions for this how to survive the holidays like the zine about queer resilience um the number one recommendation headphones <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> so yeah these do not have to be like serious um no. serious things like have have fun with it yeah well i mean look at this one this is not a serious text <laughs> this is not a serious text i think especially thinking about um seeing them as alternatives for roots through which to disseminate research is you don't have to like, I've gone through peer review a few times and there is, there is this academic expectation to be really, really serious and to be really almost clinical about your research. And especially if it's something that impacts your life, especially if it's something that is really personal, that sort of, it can suck some of the soul out of it a bit. And I think zines are a great way to sort of inject that soul back into the information and the knowledge that we have and the fact that there is I think one of the great words that sort of came out of this is the, the idea of these genealogies of zines and zinesters which is just I think that's one of the reasons that I sort of pitched this to Steph was just saying like well it'd be great to have this thing that we've made at the at the conference that we've all had input with I think one of the really cool things is how accessible I think the format mm. is just lend itself to be replicated like you mentioned yes. how things are copied and photocopies low resolution yeah. like it's intentionally very accessible yeah um, and that's one thing I find really cool about the format um, I don't mm. really have a lot of zines but I do collect comics so I have some zines from some comic artists um, and this one is my favorite it's called pain um, and this artist, Creota Wilberg, um, had a lot of problems because she draws a lot. And so mm. she created a scene for other artists to talk about like what the experience of feeling pain and what to do about it. And then like 
yeah. exercises and I'm like this is so cool like this just sort of like really speaks to her personal experience more so than her comics but she kind of uses yeah. both of them and I just love how tiny some of these are like yeah. one's called King Cat I, I really like this artist this is more of a comic than than like I would say a zine but um my comic uh bookshop the local one has so many zines and I just love it's kind of messy all over the place everything is a different yeah. size but I just love these little pocket format ones yeah. Um, another thing I wanted to share is not really a zine, but it feels like a zine to me. And some of you may have one, this one, yes. uh, the Garden Women Coloring Book, uh, which I've been saving and have not <laughs> colored in yet. I'm sure, Steph, have you tried it? Have you started it? No, I haven't. <laughs> but thank you for the reminder. Uh, but hey, so I just, this, in it? yeah, it feels very, uh, very much like a zine, though it's a little more like formal. Mm. Um, but if you don't have this one, it's a really fun want to have mm. oh. amy johnson who i believe uh sally wainwright is working on some project about right is in here yeah yeah yeah. one of the other people mm. the bronte sisters yeah something look through yeah because i've got um i can't remember where i got this actually this is the thing is you end up finding zines in the most innocuous places it's often it is often in like the little random independent bookshops um oh what is the title of the coloring book again is it great women of the north the great northern women coloring book nice i got speaking the words of, just in the wrong order yeah yeah speaking of coloring books just to share for other people that are maybe trying to think of like ideas for what they want to do mm. for their theme page i have a colored page of a beaker pop illustration that i'm going to cut out some pieces of yes. which is fine I'm not destroying anything it's digital I can print another one and it'll be fine but um there's some great goats on here that I plan on adding to my zine page and then I okay, also the goat thing? there th there's so many entries but there's one particular entry that Jenna Beyer uh transcribed before the mm -hmm. first summit um it was a trip to Wales and I don't even want to try to pronounce the name of this castle Liv do you want to give it a go <laughs> No. <laughs> the entry is linked on our um not to plug the merch site but on on our merch page if you mm -hmm. see the no goats mug the no goats t-shirt the the source <laughs> of that entry is there but basically Anne was visiting a castle and her commentary was just no goats no goats so yeah which I'm I for whatever reason down, that tickles that's, us. Inter yeah. that's interesting for my reason <laughs> that's for the link live also, I took a photo of a wax seal stamp that I have. That would be perfect. I might cut that up and incorporate that, that to a page. That would be perfect, yeah. Yeah, some imagery of Ann Lister. Yeah. I'm, I'm not, not an artist. I'm not drawing any of my stuff. Mine is all cutting That's out fine. and painting. Yeah. That's, I'm just, I mean, I'm just I cannot, for everybody. I cannot draw to save my life, which is why when I went to that zine workshop a few months ago, um, I was just like, okay, I'm going to collage. And I'm just going to find bits of magazines and just stick them together. I managed to find this picture of this woman who was just like sort of generic early 19th century woman. I was like, cool, I'm going to cut her head off and put a television over it. And it just makes me think of, and just that image just made me think of Gentleman Jack. So I was just like, cool, I'll just go with it. Yeah. So you can make it what you want. Liv, did you have one other thing that, that you were going to say? Um, I said, I don't really know what I'm going to do, but I thought, I would try to use materials that are not very comfortable for me, but oh, kind of speak oh, to the theme, like right? this set of felt and pen things. And mm -hmm. uh, Steph designed this fantastic um, seal that has, oh. uh, I don't know if you can see, the Pact of Potential seal. Oh my <laughs> God. Okay, here's an example of it. Just sit yeah. down. Um, but another thing I don't know how to incorporate, but I, I do want to, is uh, when I went to Shibden last March, April, um, I gathered a lot of um, leaves and acorns and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll see. So you should, yeah. Are you going to do like a, a rubbing, like sketch over one of the Shibden <sighs> leaves or something? Maybe. Maybe. It feels so creative. Yeah. Um, I've just had a note from Kat. So we've got, um, well, I think it's just after five now. Um, but if we can wrap up and we can all shift into the water closet and continue talking about this, 
or move on to other topics because then we've got I think it's queering language next isn't it excellent okay, thank you so much for coming along bye everybody bye